what I've learned this year is that we need to take a broader view of our responsibility. It's not enough to just build powerful tools. We need to make sure that they're used for good. You should have the ability to go in and clear your history at any point that you want. So we're working on a version of this for Facebook too. We're gonna call it Clear History. What are the moments on the platform where something important or meaningful happened? And what can we do to build more tools for that? Which is what gets us to dating. In a way that was opt-in, in a way that was safe, a way that took advantage of the unique properties of the platform. And so that's what we've designed. We think that by bringing together these different sets of builders, that you ultimately generate ideas, you build products, you build tools, and you build services that give people around the world the power to build community. And like we say with our mission, bring the world ultimately closer together. Messaging is gonna do a lot for us, but the most important thing to focus on is how it keeps us connected with the people who matter to us most. For the very first time, you're going to have the ability to talk to almost anyone you want in the world, even if you don't speak the same language. And this will power connections that weren't possible before and definitely make the world a lot smaller. We're also making immersive technology social from the start. Imagine taking these 2D photos and videos, reconstructing a place and a moment that's important to you. This is how we can get back to moments that matter to us and make sharing those moments seamless within and beyond VR for everyone. Oculus Go is our first standalone all-in-one VR headset, which means you don't need to connect it to a phone or a PC. It's lightweight and easy to bring with you anywhere. We're making VR more approachable and more accessible than it's ever been. Instagram is the best place to share, connect, and explore. We've just barely scratched the surface of what's possible with augmented reality. Our team really cares about building creative tools that help people uniquely share on Instagram. With 65 billion messages that are sent every single day on WhatsApp, it's the world's largest implementation of end-to-end -end encryption. We're excited to share that group calling is also coming to WhatsApp in the months ahead where you can get together with friends and family regardless of where you are in the world. We'll put people at the center of how we design technology. That's what matters to us at Facebook, making technology social from the start. If you believe, like I do, that giving people a voice is important, that building relationships is important, that creating a sense of community is important, then I say this, we will keep building. Let's try that again. I know you were up late playing with your Oculus Go. Good morning, everyone. All right, it's day two of F8, and I get to welcome you to day two, and we get to talk about the future we are building together. But before we get there and get to talk about what we're building and where the technology is going, we need to understand the challenges we are facing today, how we got here, and what we are going to do about it. When Facebook was started in 2004, it was all about friends. We added photos, videos, messaging. We invited businesses and you, developers, onto the platform. And these changes help people connect more deeply with friends and family, with businesses and people in the local community. Now over 80 million small and medium businesses use Facebook to connect with more customers, open more locations, and hire more people every single day. But with this growth came a new set of challenges. Things like offensive content, spam, hate speech, fake accounts, fake news, clickbait, and more. As Mark said yesterday, we need to take a broader view of our responsibility. We need to ensure that the technologies that we're building together aren't just cool, they are good for people. We need to make sure the areas that we focus on are carefully chosen to ensure that we're spending our hard-fought time and energy on the things that are most likely to help people in the world. And this is why I wanted to spend today talking to you about our 10-year vision, because as we've gone through all of the challenges, hard questions that people are asking us, questions we're asking ourselves, we took a deep look at what we're focused on, and remain as committed to ever to our three areas of focus because we believe these are the areas where technological advancement 
holds the most promise to help people in the real world. And these areas continue to be AI, connectivity, and AR and VR. Now let's start with AI. We're going to talk a lot about AI today, this talk and several talks thereafter, because it is the foundation of everything we do. AI enables us to make every product we build better. We can create entirely new experiences, and we can help keep people safe on our platform. Here's just a few examples of the experiences that are enabled by AI. You heard about these yesterday. 300,000 messenger bots on the messenger platform, many of which, or most of which, are powered by AI. If you've used the Watch tab, we help you understand what you're about to see with an automatically AI-generated preview. Or if you upload your own video onto Facebook, we'll choose a thumbnail for you so your friends know what they're about to watch. And AI is critical to AR and VR applications. As we've seen lots of examples of us being able to understand the world and the people in it via AR, and without AI, we would not be able to bring your hands and your face and your body into VR to build a truly lifelike experience. Now, this is just a small sampling of some of the things that simply wouldn't be possible without advances in AI. But AI is also the best tool we have to keep our community safe at scale. Up until very recently, we often had to rely on reactive reports. We'd wait for something bad to be spotted by someone who's using Facebook. They would report it to us, and then we'd have to deal with it. Now our systems are doing the bulk of reporting for us automatically using AI. Most of the content we deal with is automatically actioned by these systems. To give you a sense of the things we've done just recently, fake accounts, which are the source of many problems on platforms like Facebook, are blocked millions of times a day via automated system. In Q1, we removed almost 2 million pieces of terrorist propaganda, 99% of which before any human had seen it. Now, thanks to advances in computer vision, the bulk of objectionable content is proactively found by our AI systems. We're not waiting for someone to see it and have to report it to us. And thanks to advances in natural language processing, we're starting to make progress on some of the most technically challenging problems on our platform, dealing with bullying, hate speech, and nuanced pieces of language that are really impactful to people in the real world. Now, compared to a few years ago, this is great progress. But it's clear we have a lot to do. And this is why we are so focused on core AI research. We require new breakthroughs. We require new technologies to solve these problems that all of us want to solve. Now, as we've built up, one of the world's leading AI research labs, we realized the work is being limited by the tools. Less than 15 months ago, we released a little project called PyTorch. It was 0.16 at the time. Small project written by a handful of people, a deep learning framework written by people who were frustrated with the current state of the art of tools and their inability to do research quickly with them. Now, in the short period of time from then to now, We've seen massive organic adoption of this little framework called PyTorch. Right now, iClear, a very prestigious AI conference, is going on this week. And if you look at papers submitted to that conference, PyTorch is the second most reference framework, referenced more than two times more than the next most reference framework. If you go to GitHub, you see thousands of repos importing PyTorch into their project. Now, when a project, 15 months old, literally written by a handful of people with not a lot of marketing support behind it, takes off like this, you know you're onto something. But I'm not here to make whizzy demos and just publish papers. We're here to make an impact in the real world at massive scale, to protect our community, to make a positive impact on people. So about two years ago, we started work on a different framework. We called it Cafe 2. And this framework was designed for massive Facebook scale. We wanted to standardize our tools across server and across mobile. Every day, Cafe2 is called on to do over 200 trillion predictions a day. Even more impressive than that, it is likely one of the most widely deployed neural net platforms in the world because it is on over 1 billion phones all around the world. This spans eight generations of iPhones, six generations of Android CPU architectures. Many of the things I showed you earlier would not be possible with it. My guess is we have thousands of instances of Cafe2 in this room in each of your pockets today. However, we realized building things like this is not something we should be doing on our own. 
We needed to bring the industry together to collaborate on tool chains so that we can all get to the hard work of building AI and deploying it in the real world. So late last year, we launched a new project, and we called it Onyx. And this was a tight collaboration between ourselves and Microsoft and Amazon. The idea here was simple. We thought scientists and developers should be able to use their tools of choice and make sure that they could run on their cloud service or mobile device of choice at peak performance. And we've seen great collaboration across the industry to make this happen. Now, we are bringing the leading edge research of PyTorch, the 200 trillion scale of CAFE2, and the open industry collaboration of Onyx together into the next major release of PyTorch. We call it PyTorch 1.0. It can, okay, you can cheer. <laughs> Sorry, I got in the zone there. For any of you who've used these tools, this is something to cheer about, because what we're doing here is simple. We're taking the flexible, immediate mode of PyTorch that makes it awesome for AI researchers to do state-of-the-art work without any hindrance from the tool chain. But then once we've hit something that we think we like, you can immediately convert that over into a graph-based mode that works well and scales to the 2 billion Facebook user scale. Now, we have already used this system in production, so we know that it works. And we're happy to report that as with Onyx, we're doing this with the industry. So Microsoft and Amazon have already said that they will fully support PyTorch in their cloud services and their developer tool chains. This is a big deal. Now, you're going to hear a theme in my talk, and it's going to be about doing this in the open and giving you code and building with you together. So this work is happening right now in the open on GitHub. It's in progress. You can see it. I encourage you to check it out. Within a few short months, you too will be able to use the same tool chain Facebook does for 2 billion people around the world. But having a tool chain is just the start. These days, if any of you have done work in AI or machine learning, you know you don't want to just start with a tool chain. You want a pre-trained model. You want a production-grade library, and, and that's where you want to get started. And so not only are we releasing this tool chain, but we're releasing many of the state-of-the-art tools, model, code that we use in our research in our production environments. And I don't even have time to touch the surface of the dozens of projects we have available and will be releasing today. So I'm just going to focus on a couple of key areas in AI, in three key fields that are really going to define what we can do in the future. Computer vision, natural language processing, and building systems that can reason and learn. Now, if you saw me last year at F8, I got to talk to you about progress in computer vision, about how in a few short years, we've gone from knowing just a little bit about a photo to drawing these really sharp masks over people and being able to do key, to key point detection, the system we called MaskRCNN, just part of our open source release. But we've made a lot of progress in the last year. Notably, we continue to optimize these systems for mobile. If you look at our state of the art work from last year and you compare it to this year on a mobile device, what you see is improved accuracy and much improved performance, running buttery smooth on a mobile device today to do this key point detection. Now, as cool as this is, in order to teach computers to understand the world the way we do, we need to go a lot further. We're missing 3D here. So we have another system. We call it Dense Pose. This is, allows us to get a full polygonal mesh covering the surface of a moving human body as you're doing complex actions. You see multiple people through the scene. Now, this is going to enable the next generation of really cool effects. But more importantly, it's yet another step to building computers that are able to see and perceive the world at superhuman capability. Now, the biggest limiting factor to making further progress in computer vision, as in many fields of AI, and you're going to hear this as a theme throughout this talk, is that we rely almost entirely on hand-curated, human-labeled data sets. This means if a person hasn't spent the time to label something specific in an image, even the most advanced computer vision systems won't be able to detect it at runtime because it hasn't seen it in the training set. Now, for production systems we use at Facebook, we train on tens of millions of hand-curated, hand-labeled images. And that sounds like a lot, but it's not nearly enough to solve the sort of problems we want to do. So we sat down and said, how do we not just 10x this, but 100x or more the size of the training set we can use to build our computer vision systems. So we've built some breakthrough technology that takes publicly available hashtag images at an unprecedented scale. 
We have trained on 3.5 billion training images using a public set of hashtags without any human curation in that data set. As a result of training on such a large corpus, we have produced state of the art results that are 1 to 2% better than any known published system out there on the ImageNet benchmark system. More importantly, as I said, this isn't just for papers and demos. We're doing this for the real world. So we've taken the concepts of this, and it is deployed in production right now, protecting people every day on Facebook. And you can understand intuitively why this is so helpful to the sorts of problems we need to solve, because not only are we training on 3.5 billion images, which is about 10x more than the published state of the art, but we're able to do it on a large number of categories because people hashtag a lot of different things. And so not only is our accuracy improved, so we get the answer right, but we're able to get much more fine grained examples. Here's some real world examples of prior system and new system, where you get much more fine grained labels across a variety of in images. And this is why this is so impactful to our systems to protect people against bad content. Now, again, Dense Pose, MaskR CNN, available for you here. The system I just talked about, the weekly supervised learning system, state of the art, embeddings for that are available for your research, all available here online. You can share, it's okay. <laughs> I know it's early. Okay, let's talk about language. Because where computer vision is there to help understand what's in an image, language is trying to understand the nuance of what people are saying. And we heard yesterday how Instagram is already in production using some of our state of the art tools, fast text and deep text, in order to help remove not just hateful comments, but bullying comments on the platform. Now, if any of you have ever asked a question on Facebook, you've used natural language processing. Because we'll figure out you're asking a question, and then we can structure the answers from your friends. So if you're looking for a restaurant in San Jose, we can make sure that you get the answers on a nice map. Well, these same techniques can help people in need. As we talked about yesterday, in India, Bangladesh, and Pakistan, we've signed up almost 8 million blood donors because we were able to get structured information from simple text posts on Facebook. Language is also critical to helping people connect. More than almost 6 billion translations are happening every single day. Now, we, last year we released a new state-of-the-art translation system. We called it a neural translation system. And the key part of that is it produces much more natural language than you get over existing phrase-based systems. So when you're having that intimate conversation on Facebook and you're friend or family member is posting in a different language, you can get the nuance of what they're trying to say. Now, we've built this in PyTorch, figured out it was great, deployed it to scale, 48 languages across Facebook. Again, using the same tool chain I talked about that's available for you to use anytime you want. Now, the same supervised learning limitations in vision occur in language. As cool as 48 languages and 100 languages is, there is 6,000 languages spoken on Earth. And if we want to make sure we can bring all of our tools and bring everyone into the global community, we need to solve for serving all of those people. So we've done some early work on a system that is able to translate between two languages without having any training data between those languages. So we don't have any human translated data, but yet we can figure out where the word overlap is between those language systems. It's a system we call Muse. Now, this is early work. But this, among many areas of research, is promising work to bring all of the tools and technologies we have to 6,000 people, 6,000 languages, sorry, all around the world. Once again, this stuff is all available for you. The neural translation system, use, available on our website in open source form to use as you see fit. OK, let's assume we've taught computers to see, to understand language. We still haven't really taught them how to learn, how to reason, how to make decisions. That's something you all do subconsciously every single day. And in order to figure out how to train agents that can do more complex tasks without human micromanagement, our research teams built a new collection of virtual environments and agents so that we could train and test them in these multimodal systems. So we're combining vision, language, reasoning to be able to ask an agent a question like, what room is the candle in? 
And then it has to navigate the world using computer vision, figure out where it is, and be able to answer the question. Understand the question, use computer vision, reason and plan. This is an example of a couple of the agents going and trying to answer this question by navigating this virtual world. Now, the key thing here is because this is virtual, we can train it multiple times faster than we could by training with robots in the real world. Now, while this replicates real world scenarios involving multimodal, another area of active research that is teaching computers how to reason is games. In March 2016, our friends over at DeepMind stunned the world when they beat Lee Sodol in a five game Go match, four to one. Now, this AI was trained extensively on human play data. They followed up last year with a new system called AlphaGo Zero that didn't use any human play data. It simply learned the game by playing against itself. Now, this still embedded a bunch of specific information about Go into it. So they followed up December of last year with another piece of work called AlphaZero, which was generalized to be able to learn multiple things, not just Go, it could also learn chess and Soji and others, and was even more powerful than that. Now, we salute our friends over at DeepMind for doing just awesome work here and for getting everyone so excited about the capabilities of AI. But we wondered there's some important questions left unanswered here. As cool as these achievements are, what else can you apply this technology towards? So we set a small effort to reproduce these recent results from December so that we could open them to the world. We built a bot that learned how to play Go simply by playing itself, self play. It's achieved professional status. So just this weekend, we did a fun series of 14 games against、uh, four different top 30 Go players.、Uh, so far, the bot's record is 14 0 against those players. Uh, we wanted to thank the Korean Go Association for helping us set this up. You can see one of the games being played here, and, and the confidence intervals of how the bot thinks it's going to do above the midline means it thinks it's going to win. So you can see one or two sort of tense moments in the games there. <laughs> Now, look, our goal wasn't to build the world's best Go bot. I'm sure there are others out there. I know there are others out there that are stronger than this one. But what we wanted to do was build one of sufficient strength to understand the concepts of self learning and then figure out how to apply these to other problems. That's why we're opening this up to you. You can download this bot, including a pre trained model and all the training code, for you to play against it if you want, or to use this technology in your own research or your own applications as you see fit. Available here now. Now, there are many other games out there. Go is great, but the games can increase the complexity quite rapidly. If you've ever played real time strategy games like StarCraft, you know it's quite a different beast than Go. It requires understanding the world is partially observable. I can't see everything at once. I have to plan over a much larger state space, over a much larger time period. So, we're also using these as, again, vehicles not to play games, but to understand how to build systems that can learn and can make decisions in a wide state space. So, again, we're going to take the technology we've been using to play games like StarCraft. You can see it in the early games doing pretty poorly and then figuring out, sort of circling around as maybe a better approach,、um, learned on its own by playing the game. By taking these sorts of things into machine learning framework and again making it easy for all of you to participate. The key thing about all of this, like most of what I talked about in AI, it's available for you. The environments that we're training in, the different bots that we're building for this, we are hoping that by working with you and the whole community, we can get to the right answers faster. So we're excited to see what we can build together. Now, again, I didn't have time to talk about anything. There are dozens of projects available for you on the developer's website in a whole variety of different veins in AI. That's AI. Now, good news is we'll have two further talks later today to go in depth on some of these concepts here. But I wanted to talk about our connectivity efforts. Because as much as we build AI to build new experiences and keep people online safe, we can't forget the people who are unconnected. Almost 3.8 billion people still aren't with internet access. And then having connectivity really boils down to solving a couple of key problems. We need to actually have access. We need to make it affordable. We need to increase awareness. And so we've been working on a portfolio of technological and operational solutions to make this happen. Over the last 10 years, we've been busy building our own infrastructure, state of the art data centers all over the world. And big focus of this has been building fast and cheap networks to connect all of these things around the world. So we've been taking the technological and operational expertise we build up here and working with partners all around the world. To help get people connected, we worked with Airtel and PZS in Uganda 
to connect almost 3 million people using a new fiber backhaul system. This was finished just late last year. We're also working with Telefonica in Peru, in the highlands, and the Amazonian rainforest in a similar project there. We're also investing in wireless technology to dramatically reduce the cost of deploying this fiber backhaul. This is where AI, once again, can be a game changer. What used to be a process for deploying point-to-point -point wireless systems that look like this, which is a worker in a truck using a periscope to make sure there's a clear line of sight between two poles, now looks a little bit more like this. Using computer vision to plot out what's going on in the city streets and find the best nodes in the graph in order to place these devices to help us build a network graph at a fraction of the cost and a fraction of the time. Now, right now, San Jose and Facebook employees are testing out a Wi-Fi-based system that uses this high-bandwidth wireless backhaul, 60 gigahertz point-to-point, -point, much cheaper than laying cable throughout the wide city. And trials like this will be running in Hungary and Kuala Lumpur soon. Like our work in AI, we think we need to do this together with industry, not alone. That's why we're working with literally hundreds of partners across the industry and the telecom infrastructure project to make sure we can get this technology to people as quickly as we can. All right, let's talk a little bit about VR. Yesterday, we talked at length about the products we're building to get billions of people into VR by dramatically reducing the cost and complexity. In products like Oculus Go, hopefully you all have had a chance to try it since yesterday. We're continuing to push the state of the art in the standalone category as well. We've talked before about Project Santa Cruz, which takes this to another level with fully tracked hands and head in a standalone system. Now, this prototype system is now in the hands of early third-party developers, so I'll have some exciting updates to share with you later this year. But today, what I wanted to do was talk a little bit about the future and where this is all going. Where our goal is to make it possible for you to be in VR and feel like you are with someone thousands of miles away. In order to solve this problem, there are so many difficult technical challenges in VR. We need to be able to display the world as if it's real. We need to be able to capture the motions of a person. We need to then package it up and send it across the world and re-render it on the other side as if it's a real person there, again, so you're indistinguishable from reality. So we're going to focus on a couple of key problems here that we need to solve to make this done. Let's start with optics and displays. If you look at state-of-the-art VR systems on the market today, which is the top line, and you look at what your human eye is capable of perceiving, that's the second line, you can see we're quite a ways away from something that will feel like reality to you. Now, the good news is pixel density mostly will get solved as panels get more dense over time for manufacturers. But the two other problems, field of view, which is how wide can I see, and depth of focus, can I look at multiple depths, requires new technology. Luckily, our teams at Oculus Research have been spending years working on this problem and have built many different prototypes that address both of these challenges of field of view and depth of focus. And luckily, we're going to have Maria from Oculus Core Tech up here just later on this very keynote to go into a lot more detail on some of the work here. But just come with me on a journey for a second. And imagine I said to you, I have this amazing headset, and it's able to reproduce the world that's so real it's hard to tell the difference. In order to achieve our vision, there's much more that needs to happen. We also need to capture the real world, because if I wanted you to feel like you were at F8 again, I need to capture the stage and the concepts and everyone in it so I can re-render it in virtual reality. Our teams and research have been doing state-of-the-art work on this as well. This is a 3D rendering of a real captured room. I've been in this room, and you can tell because of the depth maps here. And as you see it playing, you realize how hard it is to tell the difference between this and a video or being in the real room. And what's particularly impressive about this work is if you look right here, we're able to get the reflections in the mirrors. So when you see work like this and realize we'll be able to capture and re-render the real world to this level of fidelity, you realize it's going to be a game changer. OK, so I got two things. So imagine I'm on a journey with me. Got this headset. I can re-render the real world so it looks awesome. We're still missing two really hard parts. Got to capture me in VR. You got to get the animations of how I'm moving, how I'm expressing up here, so you can replay it across the globe. One of the hardest parts of this is hands. There's such a huge part about how we express emotions and concepts to each other. 
yet they're surprisingly difficult to capture. If you can imagine the overlap of your fingers, the fast and fine motions, very easy to make mistakes. What you can see here is, again, state-of-the-art work on building systems that are a reference level for how we could do hand capture in VR. And we're working on projects like this to get all of your body digitized into VR in a robust, fast way. OK, so I've got this amazing headset. I've recaptured the real world, and I've come up with all of this technology, which allows me to take all of the motions I'm making and bring them into VR. We're missing one key thing. I need to take all that information, I need to send it across the globe, and re-render me as a realistic person. Now, my first experience in remote social presence was this little thing called Toy Box. Many of you might have tried this in VR, and it's just a blue faceless head and blue disembodied hands. But because they move, animated by a real person, and it's the real person talking to you, it's surprising how much this gives you a sense of presence. And for those of you who are here, two years ago, I introduced the world to selfies in VR in our first early demo of a thing called Facebook Spaces, and we had a slightly better blue avatar at the time. Since then, we've shipped Facebook Spaces and made significant progress, version over version, in enhancing the realism of the avatar. And this, again, is where AI is a game changer, because we're now at the ability to take a single photo and create a very photorealistic avatar from, or near photorealistic avatar from that single photo. AI has also been critical to help us in products today have these systems move in a more realistic manner. One of the challenges is, as I'm talking, making sure the mouth moves in a way that looks realistic, that matches my speech. And again, we need to do this not just in English, but in all the languages people might use in VR. Once again, PyTorch to the rescue and a new state-of-the-art lip sync system built on top of AI. Let's see it in action. So what you're going to see is the person speaking and then their avatar moving as they this speak. This model was trained on PyTorch, translated via Onyx, deployed on Cafe2 into spaces to be run with this next generation avatar. Este modelo ko PyTorch se train kiya gaya hai. Durch Onyx übersetzt. Cafe2 übersetzt. Il lançado spaces pour créer cet avatar dans son avatar que hui tao zhang. So this is a pretty big leap from a faceless blue head. We've made a lot of progress in the last few years. But we're still not... And this is a product you can use today. But we're still not at indistinguishable from reality. So our teams have been working hard trying to take a photorealistic avatar and animate it in real time from VR. You can see an example here of two of my colleagues working on this problem, communicating with each other in VR, and this is what they would look like when they see each other in VR. Okay, so when you start putting these pieces together and say we're working on problems on the displays, we can capture and re-render the real world, we can capture the human body and, and real fidelity and bring it into VR, and then, oh, by the way, we can render it into an avatar that looks pretty darn close to real, you get why I'm so excited about our vision of being able to connect across distances and why we think we can solve this problem in a way that no one has seen before. And this is why we are so fired about, up about VR to this day, because we think it will be the only way we will get people to connect over very large distances. That's a preview of some of the areas we're focused on here in AI and connectivity in AR and VR. We have three more exciting keynotes for you to deep dive in two areas of AI and to do an even deeper dive in some of the technologies I gave you a sort of sneak peek on in VR. So stick with us. Coming up next, I'm proud to introduce Srinivas, who's going to do a deep dive in how we use AI at scale. Thank you, everyone. Have a great F8. Hey everyone, good morning. Who wants to see a fun old family photo? That's me standing in the back looking funny. I grew up in India in a close family. When I moved to the US in the 90s as a grad student, a phone call to my family cost 70 cents a minute. And they spent a lot of my student income on it. Facebook profoundly changed that, and it's helped me and billions of other people stay much more closely connected to friends and family all over the world. At this scale, AI is one of the best tools we have 
to help people connect with what matters most to them, to remove harmful content from our community, and to help people in need. Today, I'm going to share some of our recent innovations in AI and how we are applying it at scale. One of the core technologies we're working on is image recognition. By understanding what's in an image, our systems can help connect me with the things that matter most to me. For example, I'm always looking for great South Indian restaurants. So if my friends are posting pictures of dosas, I definitely want to know about it. Computer vision can help with that. We have now created the world's best image recognition system. It achieves the highest score ever of 85.4% top one accuracy on ImageNet, a data set widely used for benchmarking. Most recent advancements reduced classification errors by just 1% to 2%, but our system accomplished a 13.6% improvement. That's a big jump. These results are awesome, but what's also incredibly cool is the way we did it. Conventional systems use images that are carefully labeled by human annotators, but that approach doesn't really scale well. So we created a new breakthrough technique that takes lots of easily available but noisy and imprecise labels, in this case hashtags, and made it useful for training. This enabled us to train at an unprecedented scale, 3.5 billion public images with hashtags. If you looked at one photo every second, it would take you 100 years to look at all these photos. And to train on all these photos on a single machine would take a whole year. What's more, our models have so many parameters that it's too large to fit into the GPU memory of a single machine during training. To solve these problems, we created a highly scalable and robust infrastructure that enables very large models and distributes training across hundreds of GPUs to cut the training time to just a few weeks. The end result is a state-of-the-art system that can identify things at a much more accurate and detailed level than ever before. With over 20,000 categories across many verticals like flowers, birds, hot dogs, no hot dogs, etc. And it can really recognize very fine-grained species in flowers and birds like strelitzias and eastern meadowlarks and things, which is really cool. More seriously, we will be able to use this to provide visually impaired people with richer descriptions of photos. We'll be able to filter out harmful images, and we'll be, help you, we'll be able to help you see the things that you really care about. If a picture is worth a thousand words, a video may be an entire library. I love tennis, and this is a video of my nephew playing. The interesting parts here are the actions, that is the movement of the ball and the players. And to understand that, our systems need to understand not just the pixels in the image frame, but also the movements across time. And that's a much more challenging problem. So we first did this a few years ago with our deep learning-based model for videos called C3D. It's a widely used open source project, and it helps understand actions across time, but it's also computationally very intensive. Earlier this year, we created a new model, res 2 plus 1D, that uses a very novel space-time factorization technique to process the huge amounts of data much more efficiently while also achieving state-of-the-art accuracy at that time. It can tell the difference between a golf player chipping and putting, which I still can't. <coughs> this is awesome. But to deploy this at scale, our models need to be even more efficient. Today, we're introducing our new model that pushes the state-of-the-art even further, ResNext 3D. It's even more accurate but more impressively, it's three times smaller and three times faster. This makes it practical to deploy at scale to all videos on Facebook, and it'll help people find their meaningful video moments much more easily. 
We've also made important advancements in language understanding. More than 50% of people on Facebook don't speak English, and many others don't speak each other's language. I grew up in India, a country where people speak lots of languages, and I've seen firsthand how language differences can be a barrier to communication and even cause for conflict. To lower these barriers and to bring people closer together, we built Facebook translations. Last year, we transitioned to a fully neural network-based machine translation system. The neural system produces much more accurate and natural translations than the previous statistical phrase-based translation system. And it's now delivering nearly six billion translations every day. Personally, I'm excited that my mom, who lives in Chennai, can benefit from this and interact with content I share in Tamil, her language of choice. And she can be really happy that I'm eating good homemade doses. <clears throat> Let's take another example of language understanding. This is M suggestions. Here, our systems understand the intent of the user to offer real-time suggestions. To do this across languages, conventional techniques would require lots of training data for each intent and every language, which is not very efficient. So we used a new technique called multilingual embeddings. Here, we position words with similar meaning, regardless of language, close together in vector space. For example, the words football in Spanish and soccer in English are close together because they mean the same thing. This multilingual representation enables us to train classifiers across multiple languages at the same time. And it's how we quickly brought M suggestions to Portuguese, French, and other languages. There are more than 100 languages that are used at Facebook today. And our AI systems are helping create meaningful experiences for people regardless of their preferred language. Now, I talked about computer vision and natural language. A really exciting area is to actually bring these together, along with speech. And it's called multimodal understanding. Let's look at this five-second video. <laughs> the pixels tell you you have people playing tennis. The audio tells you it's a funny moment in the game. And the text tells you the names of the players, including Roger Federer and Bill Gates, two of my personal heroes. Imagine a system that can use this combined understanding and is able to reason on world knowledge to infer that these are huge celebrities and can automatically process billions of videos and to answer questions automatically like, show me the funniest moments with tennis and tech celebrities. From innovative language understanding and translations to state-of-the-art computer vision, we've made exciting progress in AI. These are deployed across products at Facebook at a massive scale, and our AI infrastructure is running more than 200 trillion predictions every day. As Shrep mentioned, we're open sourcing our AI tech to the developer community, and now you can build upon these advancements that I just talked about. Now, I want to share a few examples of how we are using AI to protect and help our community. We use image, video, language, and speech understanding to proactively identify and remove clickbait, engagement bait, pornography, violence, and other inappropriate content from among the millions of posts every day. Some content is still more difficult for AI to understand. For example, it's helping detect hate speech, but humans need to review it to understand the intent, the subtleties of language, and context. To understand why context is so important and challenging for machines, consider how much the meaning of text and images can change when combined or placed in a different context. We've had success applying AI to help with these issues, but there are still challenges ahead and we are continuing to work on these hard problems. Beyond dealing with objectionable content, our AI systems are also enabling us to help people in need. And these are some of my favorite examples. 
Nikki Brian lives in Chicago, and she went to Puerto Rico to help with Hurricane Maria relief. She posted in a group asking where supplies were needed most urgently. And our language understanding tools extracted the places from the comments and built her a map that she used as a guide on the ground to deliver aid. Similar technology supports charitable giving and blood donations, which we launched last October. And it's helped millions of people already. AI also enables us to proactively help people who are expressing thoughts of self-harm or suicide. The tools can spot signs that a person may need help and can review and escalate to first responders quickly. We launched this in November, and as of March, we have worked with first responders on more than 1,000 wellness checks. I think this is really powerful work. Thank you. At Facebook, we are using AI to deliver things that wouldn't be possible otherwise, connecting people to what matters most, removing inappropriate content, and even helping to save lives. This will be one of the most transformative technologies ever. And I'm incredibly excited for the future as we continue to innovate in AI and apply it at scale. And now, to talk about how we are doing this responsibly, Here's Facebook research scientist Isabel Klaumann. The scale you've heard about today is big. So we at Facebook have a unique responsibility and opportunity to engage in the societal issues of our times, like AI ethics, trust, and fairness. Today, I'm excited to share with you how we're approaching these issues. But first, I want to share a personal story. So let's jump in, because in case you can't tell, I'm about seven months pregnant, and I feel like I could have this child any minute. I can't wait to meet my baby. It's my first. I thought I wanted a baby girl, I admit. I'm a woman raised by a single mom with five aunts, so I figured I'd know what to do with a girl. But when we found out we were having a boy, I was actually relieved. Now I can just tell my son to be like my wonderful husband, Jonathan, and call it a day. The responsibility's off me, right? Not quite. <laughs> Having a kid is a wonderful and life-changing opportunity, but it's a ton of responsibility. You have to teach kids everything while instilling in them a strong set of values. So, Similar to how we teach our children, we also teach AI systems how to learn. We pass along our values. AI is the next generation of technology, so we have to decide how should this AI treat people fairly? How can it support people in sensitive contexts without compromising their privacy? These are ethical questions. And as the teachers of AI, we have a responsibility to grapple with them. Because AI is not just helping us build community at Facebook, AI is remaking industries across the globe. More than a science, economists call it a general-purpose technology that transforms every field it enters. Healthcare, farming, transportation, education. And AI's effects are not just per pervasive, they're personal. AI informs decisions that have an immediate impact on us, whether or not we get a loan, our sentence in the justice system, or if a business decides to interview or hire us. AI is already having an immediate impact on our daily lives. So we need to ensure that it treats people well, that it protects them, and that it works for them. But this won't happen automatically. So let me share how we're approaching AI ethics at Facebook. But ethics is an extremely broad topic. So today I'm going to deep dive into one of its particularly important and challenging aspects, 
just how to build fair and unbiased AI systems. We're taking a holistic view, investing in the people who are the builders of AI, the data that we use to teach it, and the algorithms which represent what it is ultimately learned. And it begins with the people, the builders and teachers of AI. So we believe it's important who these people are. If AI only learns from a small group of technologists, it will only see a narrow point of view. So it takes a village to raise a child, right? So we need a diverse set of voices at the table. But no table of people and no set of voices will be perfect. For example, we have to account for the fact that we all have unconscious biases we can't entirely eliminate. Like, what do you notice about me? Probably that I'm a woman, maybe that I'm pregnant, that I'm white, or something about my tone of voice. Whatever your associations, they're probably different from the person sitting to your left or your right, and they're not that informative. Right? Would you have guessed that I'm part Venezuelan and part Norwegian, or that I used to be an astrophysicist? But since people design, develop, and generate the data that we use to teach AI, we need to understand and mitigate our biases so we don't pass them on, so our AI can do better at this stuff than we have. So to help do this at Facebook, we have research, product, and other review processes that provide independent checkpoints on the work people are doing. These involve external feedback to help grow the table and ensure that a multitude of perspectives shapes our direction. But process checks alone are not enough. We need to ensure that our actions and their consequences are aligned with an ethical framework. Whether we're building better translation services, helping people protect their identities, or create avatars in social VR, each project impacts how people connect, communicate, and express themselves. So we know the stakes, and we ask technologists and social scientists to work together, to think critically about how and why we're changing the world, to ask and act on the question, is this how we have the most positive possible impact for people? A core part of that question comes down to the data we use to teach our AI. So let me show you what I mean with a product that's super fun we have in production right now, automatic avatar generation for social VR. So this is my avatar, and I think she's pretty cute. I identify with her. But we're not just building an avatar for me. We're building an avatar for all these folks, and for all of you, and for everyone. right? So how do we do that? Well, we need art that can represent people's diverse faces, including beards and mustaches, things that we never would have needed to think about if we were just building avatars for me. And second, we need AI that can automatically select the right art for each of you. To do that, we need to have trained our AI on a huge diversity of faces. And since that training process uses photos that people have labeled manually by hand according to hair type, skin tone, aesthetic appeal, and other physical attributes, we need to ensure that those labels that people applied are both accurate and unbiased. Oh, Hand-labeled data sets like this power AI systems across Facebook, beyond avatar generation, from products like newsfeed ranking to our integrity and protection efforts. So the team that manages all of these labeling projects has an important responsibility. They've developed bias mitigation guidelines, which illuminate areas where bias can creep into the labeling process. This ensures that we scale 
robust and unbiased labels to all of our products. But no matter how much energy you spend trying to ensure that your labels and your data are good, you need to ask, what has your AI learned from that data? And ensure that it's not inadvertently learning some bias that was missed in your data collection phase. So how do you do that? How do you test the bias or fairness of an algorithm? Let's explore this question through what we did with our jobs tool. How this product helps job seekers on Facebook around the world search for and apply to openings at local businesses. We wanted to ensure that our jobs recommendation algorithms weren't inadvertently biased in favor of some demographic groups over others providing disparate economic empowerment to only a limited group of people. So we worked with leading researchers from the algorithmic fairness community to develop a new internal tool called a fairness flow. We started building this last summer, and it's designed to measure an algorithm for biases across a growing number of parameters. We used this fairness flow to ensure that our jobs recommendation algorithms were providing value equally to both women and men and to people who are over 40 and people who are under 40. The fairness flow starts with the data and asks how diverse were the people for whom these algorithms were optimized. But just as important is what an algorithm does with that data, right? So the fairness flow checks how robust are these algorithms in providing high-quality recommendations to people from each of these subgroups? But diverse data and robust model performance are just two metrics. There are a wide variety of other concrete metrics we have in the fairness flow that can measure an algorithm for potential biases. But we're not the only ones working on this. These bias metrics have largely been identified by the external AI ethics and fairness research communities. Sometimes these metrics can even be at odds with each other, so we think it's important to look at the question from as many angles as possible to ensure there aren't some hidden negative outcomes that we're missing. Now, this is an analysis we did on production data using a tool we built which is really exciting, but there's a lot more work to do. Still, I'm happy to share that these algorithmic checks and balances will become a part of the ongoing product evaluation for our jobs recommendation algorithms. Local businesses create more than 60% of new jobs, so it's really important to us that these recommendation algorithms are providing value to everyone. Now, we're working to scale the fairness flow to evaluate the personal and societal implications of every product that we build. As a step in that direction, we've integrated the fairness flow into our internal machine learning platform, FB Learner Flow. This is exciting because it means that any engineer at the company can plug into this technology and evaluate their algorithms for bias. Most importantly, it means they don't need to reinvent the wheel. They can directly draw on best practices from the external community as well as our internal work. This is still an active area for research, and so these methods will continue to improve and adapt as the applications of AI and the types of protections that we need for AI evolves. This conversation is necessarily something that involves a diverse set of perspectives. Even a first step, like building the fairness flow, requires collaborating with external experts. Technologists can't provide all the answers here because many of our most important questions sit at the intersection of many disciplines and communities. Beyond mathematics and computer science, these are social science, ethics, law, and policy questions. So we can't and we won't work on this in a vacuum, not at Facebook and not anywhere. AI is a powerful and transformative technology. Harnessing that power of AI for social good 
requires us all to work together on guaranteeing its responsible use. AI isn't exactly our child, but it is our responsibility, and that belongs to all of us. So let's all work together to teach it. And here to tell you about the latest in VR from Cortec at Oculus is Maria Fernandez Guajardo. Good morning. Sometimes people ask me, what do you actually do as a product manager in Cortec? As you will see in a moment, there is a great deal of innovation happening in VR at the foundational level. Our job is to translate what our, the technology that our researchers and engineers are developing into core building blocks that our products will use and our users, hopefully, will love. For me, there's nowhere more exciting to be doing this work than in VR. Here at Oculus, we have a bold vision about what VR can be. A platform that will give people sharing a virtual space the sense of being with each other, no matter where they are in the world. There is a lot to do. Srep highlighted some of the building blocks we are working on, and I'm going to give you more details in this. Hand tracking, visual immersion, and 3D reconstruction. Let's start with hands. Hands are vital in VR. They are the first thing you look at when you put on a headset. They are complex, they are expressive, and as you can see in the video, they are essential to communication, experience, and the sense of being there. But in VR, hands are difficult to get right. We see three levels of complexity. The first one is hand presence. You see your hands there, and you realize that you are about to live an experience in the first person. Second, you need to use them for simple interactions, like you would do in any interface, like a phone or a tablet. You touch, you tap, you scroll. Third, you need to use them for complex actions, like playing a music box. This requires precision and dexterity. And it usually involves two hands or a hand and an object interaction. We are set out to create technology for those complex interactions, because that's how you expect the world to work here and in VR. To do this, we are investing in new technology to train our models. It is based on AI and tracks hands real time in high fidelity. How does it work? We use a motion capture system, and we collect and label 3D marker positions from hands. The aim is to turn these marker positions into labeled hand poses that we will use to train our models. But labeling the markers is particularly hard for complex interactions. We have reformulated the 3D marker labeling challenge into a key point regression problem in 2D images. That way, we can solve it with a convolutional neural network. We call this deep marker labeling. Leveraging techniques from machine learning, our method is robust to occlusions and distractors. It's far more accurate than any method before for tracking a single hand, two hands, and hand object interactions. Let's talk now about visual immersion. To be compelling, your VR experience needs to be comfortable and have convincing visuals. Otherwise, you will never completely be immersed and, and believe it. We have been working on some of the visual limitations in VR, like improving visual comfort, your ability to interact with close objects, and increasing the field of view. First, we have to work in how your eyes focus in VR. Traditional headsets have a screen with a fixed focal plane. When you look at an object that is in the mid-range distance, your eye's focus works well because it matches the focal plane of the screen in the headset. 
But if you try to look at something that is not in that focal plane, like an object that is close to you, things become blurry. To work around this problem, the VR industry has been placing objects at a distance of about two meters. But this is limiting and is not realistic. Great VR has to work with objects that are close to you too. If you are given a note, you should be able to read it. Second, we have to increase the field of view. Currently, the field of view of the headsets are about 100 degrees. But humans naturally see a much bigger field of view, about 210, 220 degrees. We gather a lot of information from our mid and far peripheral view, especially important in social interactions, where you want to read the body language of people uh, around you, like if you are giving a speech and people are bored. Are you with me? <laughs> we have to improve in these areas. And we are. This is a fully functional prototype that we have developed to advance some of these technologies. Internally, we call it Half Dome. What you're seeing here is the integration of body focal technology. Think about it like the moving lenses in the autofocus function in cameras. To provide the same level of focus, we in VR move the screens depending on what you're looking at. This solution gives you visual comfort, clarity, and as you can see, up-close sharpness. We have also optimized the mechanical design. Despite having the screens moving inside of the headset, you don't notice noise or vibrations. And for a compelling visual experience, it has a 140 degrees field of view. You can see the difference. <laughs> the added bonus, our continued innovation in lenses has allowed us to pack all this new technology and still keep the rift form factor and weight. Pretty exciting, huh? Let's talk now about 3D reconstruction. VR can be magical. It can take you to space or to the deepest oceans. It can take you to front row at Fashion Week or to a pit in Formula One race, if that's really where you want to be. But for many of us, the most evocative, meaningful places are often more personal. Your home, your parents' home, your preferred vacation spot. You may want to bring those familiar places into VR yourself, capturing the world, reconstructing it in 3D, and sharing it with others. We are working in improving 3D reconstruction in two ways. First, by making it more accessible, so it's not only the result of expensive equipment or professional artistry. And second, by increasing the fidelity of what we capture and render. We saw yesterday a way to bring your environment into VR with a point cloud reconstruction. This demo was built using traditional computational photogrammetry. It can be captured using pictures or videos from any camera. And now, thanks to our research engineers, we have created another way to do this. We take a burst of images, a regular panorama from any phone with a dual camera. From those, we take image pairs, one from each camera with the depth information. Our algorithm calculates the consistent depth and stitches them together. It generates a new panorama in 3D. We collect them. <laughs> Pretty cool. We collect them at a rate of one image per second, and we process, process them really fast in even less time than it took to capture. The result is geometry that is highly detailed, a 3D panorama offering a more immersive experience that you can enjoy in VR. <laughs> On the other side of the research, we continue to push the limits of the reconstruction fidelity with high-end systems. 
What you're going to see now is not possible with a phone, but I want you to check out the next video. It is a house tour, and it's a side-by-side -side comparison of an original video with the 3D reconstructed of that home. Can you tell which one is real? It's not that easy, huh? Okay, the real one is on the left. And the reconstructed is on the right, and the clue was at the bottom left where you could have seen the shoe of the person recording the original video. <laughs> That's Julianne, by the way. Um, this is cool enough already, but let me tell you from a technical perspective what is really, really cool about this. Take another look at the mirrors. These are a big technical challenge to scan and reconstruct. Traditional systems reproduce, produce reconstruction mistakes because they don't understand how reflection works. They believe that the images in the mirror are indeed behind, creating all sorts of weird scans. Our sensing system uses a special target, which can be seen in the mirror and localized. As the system rig moves around the scene, the target motion let us estimate the, sh the shape and the location of the mirrors, so we can properly recreate the reflection. This may sound like a minor detail, but it is getting these countless details right that will make VR believable. We are getting there. Coupled with the work, with the developments on avatars that Shrep mentioned, our advances are helping to bring the future into the present. We are proud of the progress so far, fascinated about the work we are doing, and excited about the possibilities to come. Thank you, and enjoy the rest of F8.